Well, good afternoon uh, and uh, welcome. I guess why don't each of us just say hello uh, to make sure that the uh, electronics are working. Not that we don't trust technology. Look, I'm here. So am I. I'm here. Well, at least it feels that way. Yeah, well, welcome to this uh, to this panel. I'd, I'm not going to run through the CVs of the panelists. Uh, their parents wrote great uh, stories of their accomplishments, and they're in the book. Um, the, uh, what, the way we'll do this is uh, I've got a number of questions and I'll, I'll put to the different panellists and the other panellists who uh, the question hasn't been put to will then have an opportunity to comment. So we'll, we'll do this on a reasonably structured way for I guess what I call the first part of, uh, of the discussion and then what we would like to do is open it to questions from the floor and there'll be people with, uh, with the obligatory roving microphones. So, uh, starting point, I was, I was pleased to hear, Ian, that the way you concluded that uh, with all the flack you took from one Senator Boswell, I remember being called a vacuum cleaner by Boswell. Oh, I didn't go that far. No, I, I was a vacuum cleaner. I was sucking people out of the interior of Australia and spewing them onto the coast oh. where they remained powerless and unemployed. Um, so, even with that, there, there's, there's certainly a, a, a fairly good consensus that these kinds of laws and policies, and in particular applying competition to as many areas of the economy as we can make it work in effectively, uh, has, has really underpinned uh, a very good performance of this country in economic terms and out of that in social terms. So you know, that, that's our starting point. And there, there are a number of interesting questions that that raises. And so I'm, I'm going to start, start with Ian and come back to that. But uh, when the 92 inquiry was formed, one of the major areas of remit was to extend the reach of competition policy to activities, to businesses that were exempt. And at that time, there were all kinds of exemptions, uh, shield of the crown type exemptions. And there were also bodies doing important business, particularly in the non-traded areas and in infrastructure, which were subject to those extensions. And uh, you know, an important part of the work of the, uh, of, the, of the first review was to look at those exemptions and by and large get rid of them. And I think Ian, as you've, as you've gone through this, you I think have been reaching even more broadly mm -hmm. into areas which are either exempt or de facto exempt. They may not be exempt through law, but for example, when the government provides services, it's de facto exempt. And you've, you've sought to make some proposals in terms of words but you've also sought to make some proposals in terms of this choice issue yep. in the provision of important public services yep. that, that are you know, much, more, much more on the agenda now than they were 20 odd years ago. And I, I guess given that, and, and picking up Graham Sam's last comment, there are a lot of recommendations in this report. If you look at the ones that extend the reach, mm -hmm. uh, what was your thinking and how do you think that's going to get done, particularly given the enormous opposition uh, from the taxi drivers who you no longer can use as a service? Fred, um, it won't come as any surprise to you, I don't think, to hear that the areas of the report that are potentially, if they were implemented by governments, and I say governments, because uh, obviously in health, education and welfare, that predominantly involves the states rather than the Commonwealth, uh, that have the greatest potential to improve not just GDP, but welfare, more broadly conceived, are in the area of human services. This takes competition policy, as you point out, beyond uh, where the Hilmer Review took it. Uh, we've done that partly uh, and importantly because of the growth of that part of the economy in prospect over the next 20 years. We're expecting that human services, health, education and welfare will become a much bigger share of the Australian economy over the next 20 years. Therefore, improvements in productivity, efficiency and such like that you could realise in that growing part of the economy are going to redound onto GDP more broadly. Uh, but I wouldn't want to stop there. The, the other reason we're doing this is genuinely because my colleagues and I believe that choice is important for human welfare, 
is important, if you like, for consumer surplus, for the economists in the room, even if it isn't captured by GDP. Uh, this is partly the reason why in the draft report we didn't present a number uh, to say, well, if you did all of this, then the impact on GDP would be X percent. Publicly, I've said that we would expect a 2.5% dividend over the similar sort of time period that Hilmer Mark I delivered is highly likely from this one as well, at the very least. Uh, but I don't want to focus on a GDP number because the sorts of changes we're recommending, we believe, would improve human welfare more broadly. And can I say in conclusion on that point, Fred, that that's part of the reason I, I've emphasised that, to make it clear to people who might think this is all about slash and burn in public health, public education and welfare, that that is not at all the agenda. We say nothing about public funding. And importantly, it's about making these systems work better for the ultimate users. Uh, that when, my, I often tell the story, when my, my grandparents had reached advanced age, uh, they were only too grateful for the service which the public sector offered through a public aged care facility because there was nothing else. My father, now that he's ageing, is a little more demanding of the sorts of things, but still a similar type of pre-war generation. My generation and succeeding generations, as I think about what to do with my father as he ages, and I'll be wanting a system which is much more responsive to the choices that I want to exercise on his behalf that he wants to exercise, to his preferences, to technological opportunities. I'll want the system to respond to that. And I think I'm not alone. So we're talking about how we could use the discipline of choice to help induce these systems where public provision is the norm and in many cases is will still be dominant, even with lots of other providers still involved, to encourage flexibility, responsiveness, diversity in systems which are increasingly important for all of us. If I, if I could take you to the second part of the question, which is how do you see that being achieved? Uh, yeah. And in particular, how do you okay. see the institutional structure yeah. that you're proposing uh, is going to be able to yeah. tackle that? And yeah. I come to that with the view that I can't think of anything more complex than our health yeah. system. Yeah. It but makes infrastructure seem dead easy. Yeah. But Fred, I, I, um, I hope you'll forgive me if, if I relay to this audience just a brief part of the conversation you and I had uh, when I would, had just been commissioned. Uh, and Fred pointed out to me at that point, uh, quite rightly said, you know, Ian, the circumstances that faced me and my committee back in 93 are very different from the ones that face you. Uh, and he didn't mean what I was saying before about digital disruption and ageing and so forth. Fred was making a comment about the political environment, about the buy-in of the state governments with the Commonwealth. The whole environment was different then. Absolutely true. The agenda, as I indicated in my remarks, in, to some extent has fallen away from the from priority importance. The states are nowhere near as convinced that the Commonwealth has their interests at heart or wants to work with the Commonwealth. Some people say they've had it up to here with the COAG agenda. It's all gone. It, it's not flavour of the month. So how do I re-engineer that through this uh, inquiry? That's the reason we've suggested the Australian Council of Competition Policy be a national rather than a Commonwealth body. That is to say, it's responsive to all of the jurisdictions through a ministerial council, that it has the capacity to allow for different <coughs> jurisdictions to proceed at different rates, and that it is a, a body which, in principle, could encourage the best parts of competitive federalism, different jurisdictions trying out different things in different limited trials, encouraging one another, pushing one another along. And Fred, all I can report at this stage is that the conversations I've had with the various state jurisdictions in response to the draft report, shall I say, are encouraging in that, in that way. A number of the jurisdictions have said, you know, we have it in mind that we're going to try this as a limited trial. Mm. Um, I'll give you a specific example. Uh, the Western Australians, while they seem to have great difficulty allowing their citizens to choose their own potatoes for reasons that I find completely unaccountable, the Potato Marketing Board in Western Australia prohibits the sale and consumption of certain types of potatoes in the public interest, <laughs> right? Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, our sand groping cousins uh, are completely comfortable with allowing a major public hospital in Joondalup 
which is a big growing area north of Perth, as you would know, to be run by Ramsey mm. completely. Right? No problem with that at all. Other parts of the Commonwealth draw their breath at the idea that a private for-profit company would run a public hospital. Within the Commonwealth, we've got this terrific potential for different parts to be able to say, no, 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 this isn't some airy-fairy theory. We actually do this. And it works. And that creates the potential for this to be spread about. Th that's the mechanism, Fred. Mm -hmm. I can't go and promise any more than that, to be frank. Thank you. Henry or Sharon, would you like to comment on the issue of the reach of the Act and the broadening of its reach? Well, it seems to me that there are really two rather different issues that are raised in the report. So the first issue is that of the potential gains that would come from improving efficiency in human services through greater use or greater reliance on competition and choice. And in my view, uh, there clearly is in many parts of that vast and heterogeneous array of services that are grouped under the label of human services. There clearly, in some parts, there's a very compelling case for, for that. And some of the principles that are set out in the report as to how that might be done and the areas where you seek specific agreement uh, or at least endorsement in principle as a basis for a work program, those seem to me to, again, you know, we'll argue about some parts of it, but the broad thrust struck me as sensible. But then there's a second issue which is distinct from that. And that really goes, Fred, to your question of implementation and how one goes forward. And that is what can and what cannot sensibly be done, be done by the competition law. And that question, in my view, is uh, perhaps a, a, a one on which a considerable degree of caution and realism is needed. Uh, no doubt there's a case for looking at remaining exemptions and the scope of Shield of the Crown provisions to the extent to which they still have bite uh, in terms of, for instance, the Part 4 mm. provisions of the Act. But those technical elements in themselves will not address the sorts of problems that you're dealing with. The problems in the health system, the problems in education are not going to be resolved through extending the scope of part four. They involve the design of new institutions. They involve changes in funding models. They're very far reaching in their scope. And indeed, the report itself has quite a good discussion of what would be required to, for instance, introduce a real degree of contestability on a level playing field in the schooling system. You are not going to do that through part four. And so what that means, or even through the competitive neutrality provisions, mm -hmm. which are also discussed uh, at some length in the report. And so what that means is that while the discussion in the report of the potential is, in my view, a very real and important reminder of what needs to be done. At the moment, the reality is that we don't have the instrument to do it. Mm. Sure. <coughs> I, think that I think I agree with what Henry's saying. I think um, it's, it would be a good thing to open up human services currently provided by government to competition. But that's really a, a policy, an institutional change mm. that is quite profound. And the competition laws can't address that. But what does need to happen to competition laws is that the current scope of immunity provided to government, which is really when government is carrying on business, they won't be immune, that needs to be substantially watered down. And um, the Harper Report addresses that. So, for example, when a state or a federal government privatises a business, an asset, 
the act of that privatisation is not subject to competition laws because it's not carrying on business, incredibly. <laughs> mm. um, but I think that that part of the competition law does need to change and it needs to change quite quickly. Can, can I ask something further about that? Yes. The, the, this whole question of extending the reach of competition policy as, as uh, comp competitive neutrality, as uh, Sharon has indicated, we, we propose to uh, widen the net to, it, to encompass um, circumstances wherever the government is engaged or wherever its activities impinge on trade and commerce so that the government doesn't have to be in a business as such. The New Zealanders do this and there is some experience that we've looked at in New Zealand to see how they manage to avoid what has been raised with us uh, in response to the draft report quite strongly in various quarters to the potential for substantial litigation to arise as a result of this. Just a bit of background. Um, the issue on competitive neutrality that came to us came mostly from people concerned about local governments. Mm. State government yeah. less so. There is a threshold test. So one of the issues is, is the threshold too high or too low? Uh, we don't comment a great deal about that, but it is an issue. The bigger one that's been put to us is this. Listen, um, you need to be cautious what you recommend for these reasons. Are you saying that the government, for example, should not be able to zone schools? That that would be a matter that would be litigated before the court? Are you saying, as has occurred in Britain recently, when the government decides to merge two public hospitals, that that could be struck down by the competition authority? In other words, are you saying that the government doesn't have the right if it chooses to do so, in the name of the people, to dump, well, to provide free education, free medical services, wherever it wants to, irrespective of what the private sector chooses to do or not do. Suffice to say, the issue is quite complex, uh, and I think my colleagues and I are going to be reading the submissions very carefully mm. on that score, because it's a little more complex than maybe I, for one, had given thought to in the draft report. Okay, thank you. I think I might move along, sure. not because not this isn't interesting, this is actually extremely interesting. Yeah. And, uh, in any implementation of a competition policy, you're going to have to change the way industries do their work. I mean, that's what's happened with agricultural marketing, that's what's happened in utilities. It, you're saying it's going to happen in health. It's probably an order of magnitude more complex, but that doesn't mean it isn't worth trying to do. But it will require a level of implementation beyond that that we've seen so far as we've rolled out a competition policy. The, the, uh, Rob made a comment earlier, one of my favourite quotes from Stigler, is competition a uh, hardy weed or is it a delicate flower? And uh, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting question um, and it's one to which Stigler had an answer. Uh, he said there was no question in his mind, it was a tough weed. Yeah, if there was a crack in the pavement, competition would, mm. would emerge. And there's probably no better example of that than the finance, uh, than the finance sector. It doesn't seem to matter how you regulate it. There's going to be some part of the world, some transaction, some instrument yet to be created and managed and imagined uh, that, that will allow people to, to do things that regulators uh, would rather they don't do. And uh, one of the things uh, that... that I guess isn't clear to me in, in, in the, the draft report is to what extent you're a tough weed report or to what extent this is delicate flower report. And, mm. you know, when you start to look at particular industries, you know, uh, which I understand for political reason were put into the terms of reference, when you start to relook at section 46 and how we have to in some, some way provide a different legal framework to govern what is always going to be difficult to govern uh, because competition by its nature is destructive and competition by its nature is, is rough and tumble, then, you know, are we, are we moving into, oh, this is a delicate flower or are we prepared to embrace this as a tough weed? So I might ask Sharon, as our resident lawyer on the panel, to uh, start us off on that subject. Well, I think um, some, some parts of competition law are a tough weed and, and other parts are a delicate flower. And I it's might a great answer. <laughs> I was just say, <laughs> very even great hand lawyers answer. Lawyer. <laughs> so um, I, th I think currently the merger control regime is a delicate flower. I think Australia's regime is 
is very, very fragile. It's voluntary, it's, it's not suspensory. Um, it really does rely on the sort of goodwill of companies to, to bring their transactions to the Commission's attention in advance. And one, one thing I see, which is probably more a product of the kind of work I do, is you see more and more global transactions. Australia is a very small part of the deal. And when they're negotiating the transaction, um, they say, well, we're not going to file in Australia because it's not mandatory and it's not suspensory. And it is quite difficult to deal with. So I think the, the voluntary um, regime, which some people say is not transparent enough, you know, you don't get access to the case file, um, the filing itself isn't on the public record, is very fragile. And I think um, we're going to see that regime increasingly challenged and put under pressure um, in, in the coming, coming years. So I, th I think that part of our regime is, is very fragile. I think Section 46, it's a tough weed. <laughs> um, I, I really do. I, I, don't, I don't even know that we need Section 46, and this is just my personal view. I think it's, it's sort of a nonsense to have a prohibition that's based on purpose only because it's like those criminal law cases in the 19th century where there was a pickpocket and he was poor and he wanted to steal a sovereign to, you know, to buy his dinner. And so he planned his, you know, he found the gentleman, sized up the pocket and slipped his hand in the pocket and there was no sovereign. And so he was, he was totally thwarted. Um, and so I, I think having a purpose only thing is like, it's like having a sort of thwarted attempts um, thing. And we should just be really worried about, <laughs> Marcus Betts is laughing. <laughs> He's the, uh, <laughs> the head of enforcement at the ACCC. So I, I think I think Section 46 is a tough weed and we've reviewed it over and over again. Um, all the reviews have indicated it doesn't need amendment. I think we should just sort of forget about it and move on. What about unconscionable conduct? Oh, that's, um, that's the backstop. I mean, that, that's wonderful words, but they're just words. And they're, to me, they either have some meaning or they're empty and they get abused. Unconscionable conduct. Yeah. 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 Well, the Commission's got some very important cases on foot at the moment right. about unconscionable mm. conduct. Um, it's, it's prosecutions in the supermarket industry, for example. And there was the recent Lux vacuum cleaner case that's um, over a year old now where the full court of the federal court sort of changed the test, in my view, about what is statutory unconscionability. And it said it's, it's unfairness by normative community standards. And really it's an unworkable test because what is, what is um, unfairness in business? You mm. know, is it, is it really meant to capture that? So I, I think that's got a way to go, that whole body of jurisprudence. It's certainly, um, there's sort of less expensive cases to run than Section 46 <laughs> cases. Um, and that, that can make them very attractive in some circumstances. Yeah. Henry? Well, it seems to me that when you frame a competition law or are trying to assess it and review its provisions, you, you have to make at least two critical decisions where you have to come to a view on two underlying perspectives that you can take to the problem. So the first is what you think the underlying intensity of competition is in the economy and the degree to which it requires protection, which is your question yes. about uh, hardy weeds versus fragile flowers. But there's a second question which is related to that and which is every bit as important in practice and in terms of framing a sensible regime and that's what you think about and how you view the ability of the adjudicators and decision makers who implement that legislation to distinguish between fertilizer and weed killer. Mm. And that second question, which is really about the burden that you can place on adjudicative decision making is every bit as important as the first. So let me just say a couple of words about each. On the first, which is the underlying hardiness or fragility of the flower, 
That's clearly an empirical question. Mm. And if you go back to when the Trade Practices Act was introduced in a highly protected economy with rigidly regulated capital markets, which made it difficult to finance entry, an even more regulated labor market than we had today, than we have today, and significant barriers to trade between the states, it was probably not entirely unreasonable to think that competition would struggle to develop without some degree of protection. We protected everything else, we might as well also protect it. However, I find that view almost bizarre in the current circumstances of the Australian economy, where we experience relatively high rates of entry and exit compared to other countries. Certainly not, uh, there's not the gap between uh, entry and exit behavior that there was in Australia uh, when we first systematically measured it in the early 1980s. So we seem to experience considerable mobility in the firm population. Uh, you look at the response that we had to the very large relative price shock that came from the appreciation of the exchange rate in the context of the resource boom. And you see very rapid pass-through into prices in the economy. Again, when you put all of that together, you come to the view that what we're dealing with is an economy in which competitive forces are pretty well entrenched and relatively robust. And indeed, without wanting to be at all critical of the report, which I think had a huge area to cover, I would have liked to see a bit more of that empirical assessment, just how strong is competition in the various areas? Uh, what does that imply in terms of the sorts of prescriptions that you will recommend? And so where that leads me to is the view that uh, I don't believe we really need to protect competitive forces as if they were fragile flowers of the valley, which at the first gust of wind were likely to be destroyed. And as a result, uh, I'm relatively content with provisions which may seem not to have extraordinarily strong teeth. I'm all the more content in that respect because uh, long experience, not solely in Australia, and I should say this is by no means a particular criticism of the ACCC, but long experience leads me to doubt the capacity of decision makers to sensibly distinguish between fertilizer and weed killer <laughs> as far as competition is concerned. And so I would try to narrow the burden on them, ensure there's a high level of accountability for the decisions that are made. And if I had to err in terms of type one error versus type two error, the error of perhaps allowing some anti-competitive conduct to occur where one might in principle deter it, or the uh, error of uh, uh, um, impeding competitive conduct for the sake of supposedly preventing anti-competitive behavior from occurring, I would be strongly in favor of an approach which uh, was uh, relatively minimalist and uh, judged that the costs of improperly discouraging or chilling competitive behavior are very high relative to the potential costs of catching here and there a few uh, uh, slugs or rats or whatever else it might be. We're, we're working this analogy pretty hard, aren't we? Yeah, we, we are. That's uh, right. Ian, if I could give you a, a slightly different slant on the question, mm. because I think where it really comes to life is in the financial sector mm. and in the interplay between what David Murray has to come up with and what you're coming up with and uh, the extent to which we see you know, competition is a tough weed that can live within a lot of constraint that comes out of a finance 
uh, recommendation or whether you see competition needs a stronger voice, more protection, mm -hmm. particularly in the finance area? Yeah. I think competition is a tough weed, but it's not immune to weed killer. And the Act, the laws as they're presently written, identify various types of things which will definitely knock competition over. And they often focus on exclusionary behaviour of one sort or another. Excluding competitors from a market, rigging prices, coming to agreements, these are forms of, of weed killer which will kill off competition and the law speaks to those issues. In the case of 46, we've recommended a change which we believe for the time being, it's a draft report, would further strengthen the competitive process against various types of conduct that could otherwise knock it over. Having said that, both the law, the way it's presently drafted, and the way in which my colleagues and I have approached this whole subject is to recognise that competition, even when it is robust and it's protected from various types of weed killer and exclusionary, exclusionary behaviour, isn't necessarily the best way to serve the public interest. Right. And so there are circumstances in which competition needs to be muted, in some cases even switched off. Uh, that was envisaged by Hilma. It was built into the national competition policy it is a statement which, once again, we have put forward in our revised principles mm. that there are circumstances in which competition, as good as it is, as robust as it is, is not the best way to serve the public interest. The financial system, arguably, is an area in which that issue comes to the fore. I thought the one of the issues that was uh, right ahead, front and centre, before the Murray inquiry, was as what I described at the time as a trade-off between competition and stability. Perhaps with my competition policy glasses on, I put it this way. You can easily make a case, as the law presently does, that stability trumps competition in certain dimensions. Now, that's a case which needs to be established, and that's, one, that's my interpretation of what Mr Murray's remit is. Is it the case? that we have got the right balance between stability and competition. Is stability worthy of trumping competition in every instance? Do we need a four pillars policy to switch off the merger process amongst the four major banks in the interests of stability, or do we not? Right. So Fred, I don't think there's, in, no one should be surprised to learn that there are benefits for the public which go, which transcend the benefits of competition. Uh, that's a robust principle. But I don't think anyone should also be surprised that competition can be derailed, corrupted, by behaviour which is well recognised in the, in the competition law around the world, including ours. Thank you. All right, let me switch to the third question and then we'd, I'd like to give uh, members of the audience a chance to ask questions. What we haven't really talked about is infrastructure or the areas where there are nat natural monopolies where you really can't uh, have competition doing its work because we only need one electricity grid or we only need one port in a particular area or uh, we're going to have limited uh, airports in this city at the moment, one. So um, that was an area that was extremely frustrating for us to deal with. Um, and uh, partly because what we wanted to see was a national regime and the state simply wouldn't let go. Um, so we have a multiplicity of regimes and I know you've had to wrestle with that. Yep, yep. Um, we've got ideas of a, a specialist regulator, um, we, we, which, which, is a, which is a new idea. And uh, we've got this natural monopoly issue being taken into, I think, an intriguing area, roads which to me is a special case of infrastructure mm. and uh, some proposals about pricing. So Henry, this is very much your bag, mm. this whole issue of infrastructure and I'd appreciate, think we'd, we'd all appreciate hearing from you about you know, how this re the Harper Report deals with infrastructure and perhaps more generally why infrastructure has been so difficult to deal with in terms of getting an access regime, pricing regimes in place 
that uh, follows some of the sounder economic principles that I think we've lost sight of uh, in the implementation in that area. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that, Fred. Let me start by making just a preliminary remark about your report compared to mm. Ian's report, mm. uh, which is that if I had to extend the history a bit that we've been indulging with, I mean, we've been talking about flowers, let's talk about animals <laughs> for a moment. Uh, I, uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, Hilmer was a hedgehog and Harper is a fox, uh, in the sense that yeah. Hilmer, he, he, he looks like a nice chap, <laughs> <laughs> but don't get too close. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 she, Hilmer had, had, had one big idea, and it was a very good one. Uh, it was a very good one. And, and as Napoleon once said, uh, nothing is more dangerous than an idea on the march. <laughs> and the time was right for that idea, and quite a march it took. Mm. Uh, and so that idea was that you could really secure very significant gains in productivity if you improve the efficiency of our infrastructure by broadly putting in place mechanisms that would allow competition to work where it could and have efficient, transparent regulation where it could not. And implementing that architecture was really the essence of mm. your report and a huge contribution that made to uh, not merely Australian public policy, but to the prosperity mm. of Australia uh, since uh, that time. Yeah. Uh, Harper is, is fox-like, you know, suitably <laughs> so. And uh, uh, I mean, Tolstoy had this thing that all, all, all foxes want to be hedgehogs, and uh, they'd all... They know many, many things, but they'd really like to know one, one, very, big, big. one very big thing. <laughs> uh, and that they struggle with that all of their lives. And I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure it would be fair to say about Ian, but, but uh, what happens to infrastructure in the Harper Report is that it doesn't have quite that central or unifying focus that it had in your report. So there's discussion of infrastructure in many different parts and different aspects of it going from what should be done with road charging through to what should be done with part 3A. Mm -hmm. And there isn't really that unifying vision there and perhaps it would be helpful if in coming to the next version of your report uh, you, you, you try to uh, think how you might fit those different bits together. Mm -hmm. The part that I thought was most interesting and perhaps most important is this. It's where you discuss the national access regime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was really the big idea of, uh, uh, of, of Hilmer. And to my mind, the, the national access regime was really an attempt to use uh, one instrument to solve two problems. And the two problems were the problem of the control of natural monopolies particularly in the traditional utility industries. And second, the control of bottleneck facilities, which could be in just about any industry where a market participant at one layer controlled the bottleneck that was required to access a dependent market. Unfortunately, I don't think the national access regime has served either of those purposes extraordinarily well. And what's happened is that for reasons good or bad, the control of natural monopolies in the sense of traditional infrastructure industries has gone really to specialist regulatory regimes. And there you have a sensible proposal, in my view, to bring together the regulation of those regimes. The control of bottleneck facilities, a la, a la FMG, BHP, mm -hmm. Pilbara, mm -hmm. I think has yielded very few dividends at extraordinarily high cost. And were I in your position, Ian, I would be sorely tempted to repeal the declaration provisions of Part 3A. I suspect they impose costs that 
going forward are much greater than the benefits. And the fact that in your discussion of them, and I'll end on this, the fact that in your discussion of them, you cannot point to a single area where the application of the declaration process is likely to yield significant gains going forward, mm -hmm. suggests to me that this is an instrument in search of a purpose and that invites by its existence what is ultimately costly and vexatious use. Sharon, as a leading practitioner, have you found uh, a use for the Decla declaration provisions declaration. or do you share that view <laughs> that they're a piece of the law that really we can do without? Well, there's actually been a only very, a, as most many people know, only a very small number of um, mm, de you know, applications right. for declaration. And some of those have been withdrawn, you know, midway. So the one in relation to Queensland Rail sure. um, is probably the most recent one that was withdrawn midway. But I think, um, so if you look at that, you'd have to say it hasn't really been successful. But if you look at, say, the work a bidder would do in valuing an asset, you know, for their bid price mm. that's being privatised, and they, they're certainly taking account into the risk of declaration of some sort of third party access regulation. Um, and it's, you know, making them do a proper dork analysis of the value of the asset. And so it's more the threat of it, I think, than the actuality of it mm. that does, does play a role. One, one thing I just add about declaration though is there's a very um, significant <coughs> carve out for intellectual property. And so to the extent that people are thinking that, you know, companies like Google or mm. Apple mm. Or, or the sort of digital companies going forward are going to have market power and they need to share their services, then certainly Part 3A is not the vehicle that's going to get us there mm. without significant amendment. And it would be useful, I think, if the committee looked at that. Ian? Well, I'm going to ask my co-panellists whether they thought us following the Productivity Commission in reversing the onus of proof mm -hmm. in the case of declaration was of any value. Well, I do achieve, well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's quite how I interpret the Productivity Commission recommendation about at large declaration provisions of part 3A. Uh, but I think the important point that they make, and you know, there's a huge argument to be had about the details of the recommendation, but I think the important point that they make is that the provisions as they stand uh, don't seem to work particularly well and that you would need substantial modification to make them work better. And so the question really in terms of policy is whether you believe that those amendments or changes that you'd have to make uh, would indeed yield the result that the Productivity Commission believes, uh, but as well as that, whether uh, that particular game is worth the candle. Mm. Right, we have about 10 minutes uh, remaining, so uh, we're open to questions. If you'd just uh, ask for a mic and then uh, give us your name and affiliation. And yes, you've got Bob Marks, uh, UNSW. Ian, um, when you talk about wanting to make more choice available, mm. I'm reminded of um, uh, Milton Friedman's uh, saying, uh, no such thing as a free lunch. Mm. That mightn't be the case here, but I'm just interested in your opinion of what the trade-off might be. I'm thinking of uh, minimum average cost and those sorts yeah. of in 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 yeah. implications of um, allowing more competition in order to get more yeah. choice. Will yeah. there be a, a trade-off in terms yeah. of higher price? And if so, under yeah. what circumstances? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, the answer is quite possibly yes, which, which is why we don't push the case uh, in the area of human services that what we're essentially about is 
raising efficiency, lowering cost, and so forth. That's why we emphasize choice, because in order to gain the type of flexibility and responsiveness and diversity that we're saying would be a good thing in that area, things which emerge rather naturally in um, the standard goods context, but, but which won't uh, at least much less likely to arise in the context of human services, we may well have to sacrifice some gain in measured efficiency to achieve those objectives. Uh, why? Because they produce consumer benefit, even though that might not be recorded in cost. Giving people the access to a wider variety of services, allowing not-for-profits, for-profits and public provision, of course which would continue, to elicit greater variety and innovation. In, in short, I mean, a nice example is that the, the government in these big public provided services has often been very, very leery of innovation because, of course, what with innovation goes failure and with failure goes accountability to the minister and the whole panoply of public policy risk aversion then descends mm. uh, and you don't want innovation. It, the, the system sets its face against that. Th that's why you deliver these services through a bureaucracy. They're very good at delivering a standard set of services on a large scale. That's what they do. I guess what we're saying is that the, one of the benefits of competition, as we've experienced in other parts of the economy, is the greater responsiveness variety, the ability of the system to meet a wider variety of preferences. So let that happen in the human services sector where it can. It may cost us a bit more, but the benefit may well exceed that even further. Which isn't to deny, as we've been told on numerous occasions, that in certain instances there is no alternative to, to standard public provision. And we accept that. That comes within the general rubric of having to work out what the benefits and costs are, pardon me, are in particular instances. Yes. Anyway, suddenly that burst of traction. Um. Um, Peter Carroll is my name. I'm an actuary and I was an economist once upon a time. I saw the light, what Peter. You said. <laughs> the, um, you made some comments about the pharmaceutical industry and the pharmacy mm. guild in particular. Mm. I'm wondering if you could comment, please, on where you see the learned professions mm. fitting into competition yeah. policy, <laughs> in yeah. particular medicine and law. Yeah. Well, to the best of my knowledge, Peter, uh, while of course there are, and as far as I'm concerned, as a personal view, completely defensible rules which apply to whether you can practice medicine or not, or practice law or not, that you have to abide by minimal professional qualifications. To the best of my knowledge, there are no limits on the numbers of medical practitioners or the numbers of lawyers. Now, it is true that there are limited numbers of medical provider numbers, but that's a matter of public policy. <coughs> there isn't anything which otherwise specifies the numbers, unlike taxi licenses, in the case of pharmacies, of course, there is no limit on the number of pharmacies. The limits there are imposed on location and ownership. And if I might just riff on that just for a second, clearly none of my panellists are arguing that anyone should be able to dispense medicines. That's not correct. Only a licensed, professionally registered pharmacist can dispense medicines. And ought, that ought to be the case. As Rob pointed out in his introductory remarks, the target for our, comp for our um, uh, discussion, our recommendation, as it was with the Hilmer Committee, is the ownership and location rules. Why should it be the case that a pharmacist can own a private hospital, that a pharmacist can own a medical practice, but a medical practice cannot own a pharmacy? A private hospital cannot own a pharmacy. Why ought it be the case that pharmacies can only be located within specific distances of other pharmacies in certain lines of direction? These rules are there for plainly anti-competitive purposes. That's the point. That's the point. The question that we're asking, and I've asked the Guild to come back to us, and I expect that they will uh, in, their, in their second submission, is to explain why those rules are the best way to achieve certain public policy objectives as opposed to other mechanisms of subsidy or CSO or whatever. Why this? That's the challenge that I've put down to the Guild. When, for example, in the case of wholesale distribution of pharmaceuticals, one of the arguments they make is that, oh, we have to have these rules in place so that people can get access to medicines at their local pharmacy. Well, obviously, I want people to get access to their medicines. Then why is it the case 
that there are no ownership or location rules applied to the wholesale distributors of pharmaceuticals. They are the ones who actually provide the medicines from the manufacturers to the pharmacists. If it was so important, why don't we have rules governing the ownership of the, of the wholesale distributors and their location? They're in fact public companies and they can locate wherever they like. But you're getting into very dangerous ground here because it's one thing not to be able to ride a taxi, but it's another thing <laughs> not having to be able no to access to medicine. <laughs> <laughs> I walk in, I say, this script is for my wife, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, you think we should call it a... One more question. One, One more question. We've got it. Uh, Alden Ecotra, Johnson, Wigan, Slattery. Um, Professor Hilmer will correct me if my uh, recollection is wrong, but uh, I seem to recall that part of the uh, intellectual uh, uh, reasoning that went to the introduction of the access regime was an analysis um, many years ago about the limitation of purpose under section 46. And so when you're looking at um, natural monopolies refusing to deal, it's not covered by our section 46 um, regime. Just picking up on Henry's point, if the recommendation um, of the Harper report is given effect to, namely that there's an effects test introduced to section 46, doesn't that undermine in part, or maybe in large part, uh, the uh, justification for having an access regime um, and then lead to Henry's point that maybe we don't need it if we have um, big entities, including monopolies, airports, etc., subject to an effects test on their conducts to refuse to provide access, etc. Is the question? Yeah, we did discuss mm. whether Section 46 would operate as a, an access regime. Uh, and so your, re your rec recollection is correct, and I think that's in the body of the report when we, we talked about uh, the thinking we were going through. But uh, we, and I, I come back to your hedgehog point, we were fairly single-minded about opening up these utilities to competition uh, and making sure that natural monopolies weren't being used to corrupt conduct either in upstream or downstream markets. And... Uh, we also looked at the American law where they use a, a, a general uh, anti monopolization type provision to uh, provide the effect of an ex access declaration. And uh, we weren't satisfied that that would work either because these cases take a long time. So you introduce new law and you have years of case law and meanwhile the Pilbara's mined out. Um, so uh, we went for this, this remedy and there, there is, an, uh, you can draw your own conclusions, but um, quite a, a thorough review of access regimes around the world done in the most recent uh, antitrust law journal, like perhaps not quite the most recent, but one of the last mm. in the US. And the conclusion they came to, and, and I've used this in some papers I've written, was that there isn't a perfect access regime but if you had to pick one, the Australian one's probably the best. We, I think we'll finish on that note. <laughs> <laughs> we always do well in Australia. Um, yeah. Can I just ask everyone to thank our panellists, please? Um, <laughs>